All right. It was one hour, basically, left in the program. And at that point, they had to start gall and bile. I mean, blood and guts. And obviously, because it's War Games rules, if not an actual War Games, that was one of their shortcomings also, you know it's going to go some amount of time because the first two guys have to start, and then they stagger the entrances every couple of minutes, etc. So you know that there's it's going to be a long match and go, you know, some level of time because it always has due to the stipulation. But my God, my God, on and on and on and on, the garbage match didn't stop until the break of dawn. And they, again, because they can put, you know, all of Tony's money and resources and that they've got the giant cage and they've got the goddamn production and the big building so that they can do all this shit. And they just can't get out of the goddamn rec center. They have to do the narrow-casted, small-minded, indie, outlaw, niche style of wrestling that most people are going to look at and either go, what are these fucking fake kids playing? Or, in the same match, look at these disgusting fucking circus freaks slicing themselves up. And they accomplished both of those things at the same time. You want to go down the play-by-play -play before we discuss the preposterosity of it, Brian? And there was so much preposterosity, or whatever the hell you just said. But let me just say that uh, this was also the first War Games I've ever seen where every entrant got their own... Their music played and they got yes. to run out as opposed to being around the cage. Well, that's because everybody's such a big star. They And they also, they had to be out there even longer because... Everybody had to have an entrance, including all of the plumbers people had to come from the goddamn parking lot through the arena, past the concession stand, down past the EMT station and across from the fucking beer cooler. And they just elongate everything and they won't fucking, nothing beats anybody. There were people thrown on it. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to spoil it. I just, I thought, again, the, uh, Claudio and Twinkle Toes started out first. And I noted the teams aren't ringside, so you can't see the animosity building, and you can't see one team in one corner, one team in the other corner standing by their doors, thinking, okay, you know, we've got strategy here. You're going to go in next to counter this guy. It's just a goddamn showbiz shit show. And... Again, Claudio's a great worker, and he's been buried in this whole thing, and so there's something else they might could have done something with. The rings were dark because the cage was fucking up the lighting, so you had shadows everywhere. Again, everything that... Did you hear the fans chanting, use this ring? Because I guess the fans on the far side hadn't gotten any action all night. Well, yeah, and see, that's another part of the problem, is that... <laughs> They had, uh, primarily when you do these two ring things, but it's television, you can't put your goddamn hard camera on a fucking sliding trolley, so they have to use the one ring for all the other one ring matches because the hard camera would be off center, and then the people over there, they're looking through a complete empty ring to see the other, you see where I'm going with that. Anyway, um... So, number three is Pac, who comes in through the arena menacingly in no hurry to help. And I guess we should mention the teams are obviously the BBC and everybody affiliated with them against the EVPs with their bosom buddy and lifelong chum from Japan, Kota Ibushi, and... uh that's the, the pairings in this, but obviously they're staggering the entrances. Number four was Hangnail Page. Number five, here come the plumber. And to this point, they'd been having a fight in a cage. There was nothing particularly that offensive about anything. But of course, Moxley brings new meaning to the word offensive whenever he comes in. He comes in the cage and starts stabbing Paige and Twinkletoes with a fork in the head. 
and stomach and mouth. By the way, this is the day after that Abdullah the Butcher Dark Side of the Ring aired. Yeah. And this is the week after Tony's memo about things that puncture you. And also, none of them bled at that point. He stabbed a bunch of people in the head. They didn't bleed forever after that. Then he brought in a bucket of what was purported to be broken glass and dumped it in the ring this early in the match. And people were taking bumps in it. And I'm sorry. But now, I've, even though I know these people are fucking complete idiots, especially Moxley, and I'm sure he wanted to use real glass, that was phony fucking glass because they were rolling around in it. Yes, a few people had a couple scratches on their back. You can get those from Legos. But you couldn't roll around in real broken glass like that without slicing yourself severely. And it was there for fucking 30 minutes in the middle of the ring. And so that was his contribution to coming in hot. And then it was Nicky Buckaroo who drop kicked the plumber into his own broken glass. And then he took a bump in the glass. And I, at that point I wrote, this is now everything wrong with modern wrestling. It's fake and dangerous at the same time. Silly and nonsensical while trying to simulate violence that nobody believes because it's so obviously preposterous. But guys are really getting hurt. And it devalues everything that guys with legitimate talent might do in front of these fans in terms of angles or finishes or whatever because nothing beats these fucking emaciated-looking, minute, pudgy, out-of-shape or unknown fucking morons. You got a whole collection of them in there. Fits all of those descriptions. Can't kill them. Then here comes Wheeler Useless with a chair, and they went to the break before he even got to the ring. Wheeler Useless has to come through the arena because he's a member of the BBC. It seemed like there was a lot of stuff happening in picture in picture, but it was so, I mean, it's picture in picture. There's only so much you could do to watch this. Well, and besides they're shooting two rings with a cage around it, there's fucking uh, close to 10 guys, about to be 10, and they're going to picture in picture while they're all just randomly fighting on and on. Again, as I said, there used to be some element of logic and psychology to these matches. During the entrances, the baby face shined when it was one on one or one against one, or the odds were even. When the heel had the man advantage, then they took over and got some heat so you could blow a comeback, and then once everybody got in there, then you could fight all around. This is just chaos from the word go. And so it, it gets so repetitive so quickly. And then when Matty Buckaroo came in and made his Road Warrior comeback, I noticed now the plumber was bleeding. And, you know, they, they didn't get blood from the screwdrivers and the broken glass, but then people were bleeding randomly. Osmosis. And then Take a Shit comes in with a chair. So they can't even be original. Just every member of that team just comes in with a fucking chair. And then the plumber went underneath the rig and pulled out, I swear to God, they called it a bed of nails. But it was a bed of screwdrivers. It was huge metal-looking spikes or whatever. Obviously, again, not razor-sharp or even sharp, hopefully dulled by a machinist, because people were taking body slams on them and not being punctured. I think Moxley eventually had bladed his back, but nobody else that took bumps on it had multiple holes in them. But again, that's when Moxley body slammed Kenny onto it. He wasn't impaled or bleeding, but Moxley's there covered in blood from what he's done to himself, and he gets to live out his fantasy of being a circus sideshow geek without even bringing in the live chicken. And then you got a, they got a shot real briefly of Kenny trying to t get up after a bump he turned over and put his bare hand on the bed of nails trying to push himself up. 
But, and then Moxley was standing on it. And then finally, number 10, the number 10 man who got a big introduction while all this carnage is going on with supposedly nine main event guys in this company. They stop everything to give a lengthy ring introduction and video to this fucking, again, outlaw doll wrestler from Japan that's friends with Kenny, Kota Ibushi, another candidate, another fucking Muppet, as they say, over in the British Isles, that people think is a, the world's greatest wrestling artist to these people. And here he comes, a doughy fucking nondescript fucking putz. You know, that is part of the story right there. It's interesting. He hasn't wrestled in a while. He's never wrestled for AEW. Again, this is not really his style of wrestling. But if you're into his doll wrestling or beyond that, things he's done, this kind of match isn't it. He showed up, and I've watched him before. Remember, he was in the Cruiserweight Classic before AEW started for I, NXT? I, I don't remember that, no. Well, he was in shape. He was always in really good shape. He was cut. He had abs. This is the guy who showed up here, and to say he wasn't impressive in the match or impressive looking would be an understatement. This is like a completely different Kota Ibushi. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm waiting to see this fucking meteorite flying across the sky, and I get a goddamn burnout fucking charcoal ember from a cookout. Besides his appearance, which I don't care, he didn't do anything. He didn't do a goddamn thing except stupid shit. He strolled out to the ring. Well, Wheeler Useless left the cage with his team to meet this guy in the aisle to get knocked out with a punch. Yeah, what was the point of that? Well, to I'm sure Kenny thought it'd be just great. And then this dickhead strolls to the ring it just walks to the ring with no fire, no enthusiasm. No, I'm going to come in and kick ass, save the day, whatever. And he gets in and throws one punch each and just knocks out three of the heels. Is that his, is he the man with the hands of stone in fucking Japan? No. Well, a good thing because then he and Moxley had their big stare down, you know, Japanese legend versus legend in his own deluded, warped brain. And right as Taz is talking about Coda's striking ability, he's on top of Moxley throwing punches that are so fake and so far away from the guy's head that the director had to cut away from it. The big fucking confrontation between these two, and he gets on Moxley, and it's so bad looking, the director cut to nondescript guys fighting in the corner. And then everybody started fighting again. And two of these weasels were in the entrance way. It's a fucking cage match, and they're fighting in the hat on a hat. And then Moxley bumped on the bed of nails. And then Kenny, no, it was it was Coda. Coda and Kenny. Coda moonsaulted him on it, but it was a standing moonsault. You know, I don't know if this is another guy that could climb up to the top rope or not. Is he broken down too, or he just didn't give a fuck? I wouldn't be surprised if he's pretty broken down. He's been wrestling a Kota Ibushi type style for a long time. Well, good. Then it's the Kota Ibushi type. If this is Kota Ibushi style, I've seen him wrestle blow up dolls, six year old girls, and this. If this is his style, he needs to quit. He also threw a kick, hit, take a shit, and fell right on his own ass. Got off balance. And again, they, they kept going to the break, and then they'd come back at one point. Maddie and Useless were on top of the cage, and they were doing Northern Lights suplexes to each other. I said, it's almost 40 minutes at this point. And then Matt, Matt Buckaroo, is up on the roof of the cage and takes a bag from somewhere and dumps thousands of thumbtacks into the cage so some of the other chicken biters can take a bump in them. And I wrote, did, God, this is the most self-indulgent bullshit. What the fuck? Go ahead. Did you hear, like, Scalber plugged 
blood donations while these guys oh, were on yes. the fucking roof of the cage? Yes, during this, they were plugging in. But remember, donate blood to the Red Cross. I wouldn't donate blood now to the Red Cross just on the theory I wouldn't want any of these motherfuckers to have it if they needed it. To commemorate Shark Week, donate your blood. To commemorate this goddamn brain-damaged imbecile that we fucking indulge in his delusions, celebrate that, him cutting himself over and over on our television program in front of God and everybody, go give blood. So then Nikki slides a table into the ring. And I wrote again, hat on a hat. It's like Dr. Seuss wrote this match. And the fans started chanting, we want fire. So that's where they're at. That's wh that is how that this company has educated its wrestling fans. When they're seeing all this fucking shit already, they're chanting, we want fire. And they would be disappointed. Yes, they would. And then they did some uh, choreography. We had some Broadway in there. Four superplexes at the same time on different people, not right after another, uh, by different people, on different people, and then a table break to conclusion. So four super superplexes and a table break has replaced two turntables and a microphone. There were a lot of moments in this match where someone would have someone in the corner that'd be up uh, on the second rope, you know, hitting him or whatever, but they would always pause and look behind them waiting for whatever they were expecting, whatever they were waiting for. So that happened several times. Well, because they've, they've set the whole thing up, obviously. And speaking of obvious setups, then they went for the 10-way phony punch fight where they think because there's 10 guys in the ring all allegedly punching each other that you won't look at any individual and see that it looks fucking fake. They're just swinging aimlessly. They're creating meaningless motion. And then everybody hit everybody. And then they got four simultaneous submission holes and a big swing. And I wrote that Coda looks like some guy from the college swim team that wandered in. Uh, he's wearing the fucking swim trunks and just, uh, what the, f what? <laughs> Again, I wrote, where's the greatness? So then Claudio and Pac got in an argument because Claudio hit Pac by mistake when he was charging in the corner and the other guy moved. So Pac, <laughs> explain this to me. He went and got bolt cutters and walked out of the, and cut the lock on the cage door and walked out of the match and slammed the door on Claudio's head. If they needed bolt cutters to get out, how were the two guys fighting in the entranceway and how were the two other guys on the roof a minute ago? That's a great question. They just say, uh, because the bolt cutter spot will be cool. You got to use bolt cutters. Okay. But meanwhile, the other guys didn't want to give up their spots that they thought were cool. So they just did them anyway. And then, you know what happened? They had already been going almost an hour. And as Pac walked out, it was the end of the show and my DVR froze because the show was scheduled to be over. And they gave this fiasco an hour and it still wasn't enough for them. So what happened after that? Because all, besides Pac walking out, did Take a Shit not walk out on him also, from what I read? Yeah, Don Callis pulled Take a Shit, uh, Takeshita out of the match to, uh, he saw it was a losing thing, so he pulled this guy from the losing team. Moxley submitted, but it wasn't anything happening to Moxley. Moxley submitted on behalf of Wheeler Yuta, who was being choked out. Oh, to save him. To save him. Because Moxley is so beneficent and benevolent. Hey, give him credit. If there's anyone you want to say he's been that way too, it's Wheeler Yuta. <sighs> yeah, to put him on the fucking television. So, so you ended then, the match with the five baby faces in the ring and three heels. Yes. Yes, they did. And apparently after all this was over with, it was the topic of Twitter in addition to lighting everything up because people going, what the fuck is this? clown show bullshit that they showed on the air then whenever they went off the air apparently both teams stayed in the ring to shake hands with each other 
after they'd been stabbing each other in the heads with screwdrivers and fucking throwing each other onto beds of nails. Good sportsmanship. They shook hands with each other. Sportsmanship. And then, to put a period on the, or maybe even an exclamation point on the evening, old Kota Ibushi, for no reason, no purpose whatsoever, just took his own flat back bump into the thumbtacks and then jumped up not selling it and rah rah everybody. And the clip of that go is going around, and there were even people you hear in the building going, why, Coda, why? And what is he doing? He's an idiot. He killed the thumbtack bump. That, <laughs> God damn it. Like you, the thing that you shouldn't be doing anyway, but if you're going to do it, you ought to act like it hurts. And he killed the thumbtack bump. Because they're all fucking mental cases and they don't give a shit. And they think their shit don't stink. And there were people defending, well, it was off the air. It was in front of 12,000 fucking people in Boston. Everyone with a camera in their pocket. Yes. Oh, but it wasn't on the TV show. They just did that off the air for fun. Yeah, fuck you and your fun. As a matter of fact, that should be a quote that goes around from me and a meme. Fuck you and your fun. Jesus Christ. So this was an hour of television of a bunch of reform school students and maladjusted misfits jacking themselves off under pretense of being in the wrestling business, doing every outlaw indie mud show wrestling cliche they could over and over until it was over with with the added component of Moxley continuing to mutilate himself for no good reason and no fucking financial returns on the show because he does it all the time and it means nothing except to him and he enjoys it, so he does it. And the boss can't tell him not to because the boss has no balls. Your thoughts? I thought it was awful. I thought it was just completely terrible and... Not for me. I don't think this feud has worked. Again, it was a hot crowd, so they were into it. They were into Kota Ibushi, and he came out, and he looked terrible. In my eyes, didn't impress anyone. Couldn't have impressed anyone. Why would you even debut him in this kind of match? I guess in their heads, it justifies everything they've done that they've ended. Literally, the Kota, I guess, would be this <laughs> match. But I thought this was terrible. What, uh, what star rating do you think it got from The Observer? Oh, come on. I mean, what what star rating would it get from anybody with eyes, or what did it get from Dave? It had to get five stars from Dave. Four and three-quarter stars, but according to Dave, that's just as good as five stars. Just as good. What do you, well, think, F- what do you think FTR, Bullet Club Gold, two out of three falls, got in the Observer? The best tag team match of at least modern time? Yes. Four and a half. Five and a quarter. Ooh! so he's trying to allay some of the criticism good for uncle dave again why would i don't know it's it's just so stupid that five star is in the end that now it's just all of a sudden a quarter it's a quarter better than yeah but 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 see now but he can say but look i gave somebody else besides my best friends five stars i even gave him five and a quarter that's even better than five except it's the same thing 